Coming up on AZ Sports Box Weekly, after the events of the Territorial Cup football game, we will break down where ASU football will be going next as the full season begins. Plus, with the Arena Football League shutting down, we'll talk about what events happened that caused its downfall. Stay tuned for all of this and more. Welcome here to AZ Sports Box Weekly alongside Nicholas Odell. I'm Caleb Bushy coming to you here from our studios in downtown Phoenix. And Nick, it was a great week last week, Thanksgiving. I hope you had a good one. Was it was it all right? Plenty of turkey, plenty of it. That's usually the hallmark of a good Thanksgiving and all the fixings that go along with it. Don't think I was very hungry that day at all, which is a very good sign. But you know who was very hungry? The Arizona State Sun Devils and the Arizona Wildcats as they took on each other in Tempe for the battle of the annual Territorial Cup football game. Nick, why don't you tell us all about it and what went down? Oh, that's right, a lot of good fixings going on there as they had plenty of stuff to, to discuss about. The Arizona State Sun Devils and the Arizona Wildcats usually do not like each other whatsoever. When the Territorial Cup is on the line, the disdain goes to a new level. Arizona State was looking to set themselves up for a good bowl selection in Tempe last Saturday, while the Wildcats were merely looking to send out Khalil Tate and the rest of their seniors with a victory against their in-state rivals. Arizona, Arizona State in the Territorial Cup. The Wildcats, though, not too happy with the center field logo of the sparky inside the state of Arizona, proceeding to scuff up the entire logo even the field crew in Tempe, a lot of early issues here at Sun Devil Stadium. We go now to the first quarter of the highlights. Arizona can get the first scoring opportunity of the game as they cannot convert a third and nine here though with a solid effort. So they'll go to Lucas Haversek from 47 yards out and he is going to push it a little far to the left. Only speech of the quarter going now to the second quarter where Arizona State a modest pass on a third and 16 fly gets them into the red zone and they'll go to Christian Sendejas from 32 yards out and he will get the first point of this Territorial Cup contest for the Sun Devils 3-0. But Arizona will go off Khalil Tate answer where the left side of the field finding Jamari Joyner 48 yards for an Arizona Wildcat touchdown. The first of the game for either side, Khalil Tate punt. So we go now, the last seconds of the first half, Christian Tejas will add on three more points from 24 yards out for the Sun Devils make it seven to six at the half. Going into the third, Eno Benjamin from six yards out, going right to the middle into the end zone for a touchdown, completing an 11 play, 75 yard drive giving ASU the lead again at 13 to seven. Later on in the court here, another one going right through the trenches there on that from one yard out for another touchdown, 19-7 ASU. They would go for a two point conversion where it'll be Jaden Daniels. Fun in the open room, going right down the middle, 21 to seven on that two point conversion. Going into the fourth, early moment of the quarter. Haverson again, this time from 26. He pushed it once again. So no points there from Arizona. Meanwhile, on the other side of the field, ASU kicker Sendejas right down the middle from 26 yards out, make it 24 to seven. The Wildcats though would not be done fighting back as Khalil Tate flopped it into the quarter of the end zone. That is Joyner once again, making a 24 to four team in favor of the Sun Devils after the extra point, but Tate can only watch as ASU runs out the rest of the clock with a good set of downs offensively. And the ASU with a 10 point victory, moving to seven and five for their third straight Territorial Cup win. What you didn't see was on the defensive side of the ball, three INTs, including two from Jack Jones, the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Week. After Arizona's defeat this past Saturday, Wildcat Athletic Director Dave Heek said that Kevin Sumlin will remain the Arizona head coach 
for 2020. Both Semlin and Heek said they are committed in the process of rebuilding the program. Semlin dismissed three defensive coaches throughout the 2019 season, including defensive coordinator Marcel Yates. The last two seasons in Tucson have definitely been a work in progress. In the recruiting game, the Wildcats have not been faring well under Coach Sumlin, finishing 11th in the Pac-12 in the 2019 24-7 sports recruiting class rankings and currently sitting in 10th for the 2020 class with the early signing period beginning on December 18th. Nationally, those rankings come out to 55th and 62nd, respectively, with just one four-star prospect last season and currently zero four-stars or better in the 2020 class. The Indoor Football League announced their 2020 schedule last Tuesday, and there are plenty of good games to the Arizona Rattlers to look forward to. Arizona will start the season on a two-game road trip, first opening the season against the Quad City Steamwheelers on March 21st, and then going to California to take on the newly added Oakland Panthers one week later. April 5th sees the Rattlers play at their home opener in one of two home games against the Tucson Sugar Schools in the Gila River Arena in Glendale. Two very intriguing matches will occur in the middle of the season as the Rattlers will travel to Iowa to take on the Barbstormers in Week 6 in a battle of 2017 and 2018 United Bowl champions. And also in Week 9, when the Rattlers face off against the Sioux Falls Storm in a rematch of the 2019 United Bowl Championship, a title that the Rattlers will be looking to regain this season. All right, well, it's now time for my favorite segment of the show. I hope it's your favorite too, Nick. It is time now for Rapid Fire. we got three questions here and, of course, a lot to talk about, mainly football-related on these first two. And we'll start with the Pac-12 Championship this Saturday. Oregon takes on Utah, the best of the North versus the best of the South, and a potential playoff spot could be on the line for the Utah Utes if they win this game. For Oregon, they could be going to the Rose Bowl either way, whether if they win or lose. But let's talk about the result of what this football game could be. Nick, who do you think is going to win? I like Utah a lot more, especially with Oregon having lost ASU and looked, looking very, very vulnerable because ASU said I struggled against some of the worst teams in the Pac-12. I do like the Utes to maintain their defensive dominance and be able to carry their dominance in the Pac-12 forward to a conference championship. Well, I definitely agree with that there. I think Utah has some potential, and like I said, it's been a crazy Pac-12 season. I mean, Oregon falling to Arizona State while they were sixth ranked in the country to an unranked team, that's definitely something that's unusual that has happened this season, and now that a huge upset for ASU. But I'm going to have to go with the Oregon Ducks here. I, I, I think the Pac-12 just, uh, like I said, the Pac-12 ruins the Pac-12. It wouldn't be the Pac-12 without Oregon having one last laugh in the end. And so, yeah, I mean, and let's face it, if Utah does get to the playoff, do we possibly see them winning the, uh, the Fiesta Bowl or the Peach Bowl this year? I don't think so. I think we might as well, they might as well give it to a spot to a team that will probably be more competitive. But I hope so. For any Utah fans that are watching out there, I hope they prove me wrong. I hope the Utes can go to the national championship if they get that playoff appearance and win the Pac-12 title. It would be great. I just don't think it's going to happen. But who knows? I, I hope they prove me wrong. You never know. Going into the next question, and this still relates to the Pac-12 football championship game, what will the bowl game result affect ASU's bowl chances? Now, I talked about this before. They could be going to the Holiday Bowl, Cheez-It Bowl maybe. I mean, it really could go anywhere. They can go to Sun Bowl. What do you think? Well, I think it really depends on that Pac-12 championship game and whether the conference is able to secure two teams and then in the New Year Six. If that, is, if that happens, I think the Holiday Bowl is still in play for ASU based upon the rankings. If that does not happen, I think at that point you have to then rule out the Holiday Bowl because of where ASU finished up in the conference rankings, which would be essentially a tie for a fourth with California and Washington. So now you got to really divvy up between the Red Box Bowl, the Sun Bowl, and the Las Vegas Bowl, which ASU went to last season, where ASU would fall. And I still believe the most likely spot for ASU is the Sun Bowl, uh, given that the Red Box Bowl will maybe go to California. Uh, but there's, there's still a lot that can happen this next week. Well, I can tell you two bowl games that they're most likely not going to go to. One bowl game I know for sure, the Alamo Bowl, that's definitely not going to happen. That usually goes to the second best team that doesn't get the Rose Bowl spot. 
Obviously, we know ASU is not going to be a good enough record to get, go to San Antonio. Another bowl game, the Las Vegas Bowl. They went there last year. According to the bowl game rules, unless it's like a last resort, if like four teams make it to the New Year's Six in the Pac-12, which obviously is not going to happen. But if ASU it lands into that spot, they could repeat it. But usually they end up giving it to another Mountain West team or non-Power 5 team. So I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think ASU is going to repeat and go into the same bowl in Vegas, although I'd love to do another road trip to the Sin City. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's going to be the Holiday Bowl. But it's going to be an interesting challenge to see who they're going to play. It's going to – whoever they play, it's not going to be an easy team. However, I would like to see possibly the Michigan Wolverines and the Sun Devils in the Holiday Bowl. That could be I interesting. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. But I'm going to go with the Holiday Bowl. I think, I, I think there's definitely a strong chance, even with Oregon winning the Pac-12. Well, that's uh, very, very good stuff, of course. And I still believe the Holiday Bowl will be dependent on getting those two teams in the New Year's Six, given where, how high the Holiday Bowl is on that ladder, that it's going to take a little bit of work for the Pac-12 to climb all the way up there. But if, if they do that, you could see a team like perhaps even Iowa as well. That could oh, also yeah, be a good for sure. matchup for ASU if they get there. Uh, finally, the Coyotes. They've had a very, very good start to this point, currently second in the Pacific Division and currently pacing for around 101 points on the season. So, Caleb, do you see the, the Coyotes continuing their climb? You know, they've had a really great start this past first half of the season, and there's no doubt they've had some pretty, they had a pretty healthy team, had some really good trades. And let's face this, this team has not been to the Stanley Cup playoffs since 2012. And if you guys remember in that 2012 season, how they ended it, they went to the Western Conference Finals as a third seed. They were really well, and then all of a sudden they got upset by the eight seed LA Kings, which was understandable because they ended up winning the Stanley Cup final. They were the surprise team in the playoffs that year. But I think the Coyotes can finally return to the playoffs. There's finally going to be a whiteout in Glendale. Whether where they're going to be seated in the Pacific Division is going to be an interesting debate. Last time they were in the playoffs, they won the Pacific Division title. They could have a shot at that this year. But going into predictions, looking forward to the second half of the season and their playoff hopes, I think they could get a top five seed in the Western Conference. I think they can pull it off. Yeah, and they're currently in a very good spot to do so. And it also really helps you have goalkeepers like Darcy Kemper who is really leading a charge in defense that is, has positioned themselves very nicely, currently third in the NHL with 69 goals against. So obviously that is a very uh, good stat to have, being in the top three of that category. If they can keep that up, they'll be a fourth to be reckoned with defensively. Offensively, they could use some work around the bottom half of the top 20 there in the NHL, but they're still looking to uh, get, get their footing going offensively. If they can do that. Watch out for the Coyotes. But let's not forget another star player who I think is going to be key, especially for the Coyotes getting back to the playoffs. Phil Kessel, who has been talked about, one of the biggest trades that the Coyotes made before the season started. I think that's also a key player to look out for. Yeah, he's got, he's got to get going, and the rest of the Coyotes, are, they've been doing well so far, but if they can really keep this up, watch out. There's the, oh, without a doubt. Yeah, they, they have a definite build there going, and so far it's working almost to perfection for the Coyotes compared to last year. And now it's time for Top Plays. Let's get those Top Plays rolling. First up at number three from the Battle for Atlantis, Oregon, North Carolina, Shakur Justin here with the pass. And Cole Anthony says, not so fast, my friend. Absolutely viciously blocking Justin right on out of the North Carolina would go on to win that one. At number two to the NBA, Suns and Pelicans in New Orleans, where it's Phoenix's Kelly Oubre with the one-hander on Brandon Ingram. There, now look at that from above. Suns get the win, 139 to 132. They are in overtime, and at number one, we go to Kelly Oubre once again from the Hornets game. Oubre late in the game, he gets a three up. That one goes down, but they still need one more to get the win. Next possession, Oubre says, why not? He gets the three, and the Suns will go on to beat the Hornets. Ah, oh, great stuff, Nick, on the top plays. Well, before we wrap up the show, we obviously have to address something huge news that came out last week just before Thanksgiving hit, that the Arena Football League would be shutting down after 32 years in operation. 
The Arizona Rattlers were former members of the Arena Football League when they joined the league as an expansion team in 1992 until they left the league due to the ongoing disagreements after the 2016 season. However, there's been a lot of speculation on how the league fell and how people never considered it to be a success in the first place. Although the AFL failed, doesn't mean it's a failure. Unlike the AAF, XFL, this league lasted so much longer than one or two years. It never competed with the NFL because it was a different style of football. Comparing arena football to the NFL is like comparing UFC to boxing. Yes, they are two fighting sports, but they are very different styles of fighting. The same applies with arena football and the NFL. Not only that, but the Arena Football League actually had a great partnership with the NFL. They were never enemies. This league gave legends like Kurt Warner, Jay Gruden, and Eddie Brown a chance to play in professional football when the NFL didn't give them a chance. Not only that, but many of these players, like Kurt Warner, ended up winning a Super Bowl in the NFL. Many NFL legends also, like Jerry Jones, Ron Jaworski, were former owners of Arena Football League teams. Even the NFL Network itself broadcasted the arena football games from 2010 to 2012. But it wasn't just the attention from the NFL, but also celebrities. People like John Bon Jovi, Vince Neil, and even from KISS, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley all invested in owning arena football teams. So how did everything go so wrong? Well, there are two reasons. The first problem, the players union. From the early 2000s to even the present day, the players union caused multiple strikes at the AFL demanding that the league would give, them, give the players higher pay at rates they couldn't even afford. This created a lot of chaos that even a game got canceled because of a player strike. Because of this, it scared partners like the NFL away, so much to the point that the NFL network would purposely tape delay the AFL broadcast and not airing them until the next day until the AFL players union and the AFL league itself got things fixed. And now to reason number two. The politics. There was no doubt that a l there was a lot of division with the AFL team owners. From breaking salary cap rules to even TV deal negotiations. Because of this, this AFL lost a lot of great owners. And after five teams dropped out for other leagues or just folded after the 2016 season, things for the AFL went completely downhill from there. But now the question is, will the Arena Football League return one day in the future? Whether if it's the Indoor Football League or any other arena league that wants to take over the trademarks, one thing they will need to keep this business of football going is a group of people that are united and not divided. Oh, very sad stuff with the Arena Football League and all of those associated, of course, KO, of course, the Rattlers, five-time champions of the Arena Bowl, tied for the most in the league's 32-year history with the Tampa Bay Storm. And that's going to do it for us here on AC Sports Talks Weekly. For Caleb Bushy, I'm Nicholas Hodel. Signing off. Have a good week, everyone.